it was hardly surprising that uh, the topic of usability of simulation <laughs> software oh, bubbled up to the top. Um, and uh, our take on usability might go well beyond what you might think of it as, uh, i.e., the user interface. So let's first take a look at, you know, from a technology perspective, what's usable? Cars. There are 1.2 billion on the road today, 2 billion by about 2035. Highly engineered products. Products that can go from 0 to 60 in 3.5 seconds, and yet every single one of us in this room could step into that Pagani Zonda, that beauty, and be comfortable driving it in about 15 minutes. If you look at software, let's go back to the start of uh, spreadsheets and mathematical calculators, VisiCalc. But then it was Excel that really brought this to the fore, where when experts with Excel started to put together simple applications that were targeted with graphics, and anyone and everyone could begin to use them to do some powerful calculations. Excel now has 750 million active users worldwide. Let's absorb that for a second. Look at computers and software in general. That's what computers looked like a while ago, not exactly usable. And then we had a revolution on the desktop that started with that, and we're here now. That's a thing of beauty. It's a sculpture that's highly, highly usable. And then now to the pinnacle of software usability, apps. There have been 700 million iPhones sold. Between 2008 and 2015, 100 billion cumulative app downloads, that's a B billion, apps to do absolutely anything. There are well over a million apps just for the iPhone. Anyone and everyone taps into an app to get certain things done quickly, easily, and it's fun. So what is it that characterizes technology that's us usable? It's useful. It's got to be useful. You want to use them. You immediately see what the ROI is, even if you don't know what ROI means. They're fun. They're simple interfaces, intuitive to the user. You can grab them and use them. There's no PhD required. There's no manual required. But probably most importantly, they're targeted applications. They provide you with a focused, single solution that's easy to get to when you need to. So now let's take a look at what's not usable when it comes to, or less usable when it comes to technology. Let's start here. What do those interfaces scream to you? Usable? No. Give me a calculator that looks something like this, and my three-year-old or my great-grandmother could use it with no instruction whatsoever. We talked about cars. Well, let's talk about airplanes. Very useful as modes of transportation. But there are only 20,000 of them in use today, maybe double by 2035. But interestingly, the number of pilots in the US have gone down over the last 10 years. When cockpits look like this, and that's the most sophisticated modern one, little wonder that not too many people want to fly these things. And now to the uh, center stage, simulation software. Well, what can I say about it? They're very powerful, the pinnacle of functionality, but certainly not usability. Thousands of functions difficult to find, and yet they've been getting easier and easier to use. You've got CAD software, uh, maybe just as complex. Not so surprising that these two are not very usable except by the experts because you've got to deal with very complicated things and be able to manage assemblies that have tens of thousands of parts. So what makes these technology unusable? Tons of operations, thousands of them that you want to jam into a single entity, whether it's hardware or software. A great deal of training that's required to really get reliable and accurate results out of them. 
It is true, even today. No three experts in a company will get you the same results from a piece of simulation software. That's the dirty laundry. It requires domain expertise, as in physics, as well as tool expertise. That's a tough combination. It takes years and years to get there. Let's face it. There's inherent complexity in what's being solved here. Physics simulation is simply hard. So what's the result? As we've heard earlier today, about 750,000 approximately simulation users out of a pool of 8 million engineers. And that doesn't include the rest of the product development folks. And we'll get to that in a moment. And a $4 billion market. It's not bad. But Keith mentioned Salesforce, Salesforce I think that already dwarfs that. That's one application. What if we were to be able to empower everyone that needs simulation, every single person in the product development organization? And I'll circle back at the end of this to a couple of things that Mark said earlier that I think were absolutely key when it comes to simulation and its use. So let's take a look at my favorite subject, simulation apps. And I want to start with a, a video created by uh, Kenneth Wong. Kenneth, are you here? There he is. Uh, he was kind enough to let me use it. And he said some things here very nicely. So I'd like to use it. So let's listen. Hello, this is Kenneth Wong, senior editor for Desktop Engineering Magazine. What you're looking at is the beta site set up by the multi-physics simulation software maker, Comsol to showcase the kind of apps users can produce using console 5.0's app builder function. Now I'm accessing these apps from a Google Chrome web browser. No client, no installation needed. Now let's have a look at another example app. I'm certainly not a chemical reactor specialist by any stretch of imagination. So what happens when propylene oxide interact with water inside a tubular reactor? Even if I know my way around a simulation software program, I'd need a very detailed understanding of that particular phenomenon to be able to simulate it. But here I wouldn't have to because another expert has already done the like work and published this app for me to use. With this app, a non-expert like me can change the activating energy level to see what happens to the heat inside the tubular reactor. And I can do many more iterations by simply changing the numeric values of the activating energy to see where I might start to hit a dangerous point or start to compromise the safety factor, for example. I wouldn't have to pester an expert to help me set up the simulation and run it every time I require a new answer. What this shows is a new way for experts to create easier simulation templates and apps for their colleagues. Companies with expensive material specialists, structural engineers, and nuclear physicists probably won't want these high-paying talents repeatedly running the same simulation jobs over and over. So Comsol App Builder is a very effective way to reduce the workload on these experts by publishing their expertise as templates and apps that the rest of the people can use. That should be music to the corporate bean counter's ears. Till next time, this is Kenneth Wong, fi Wong fine-tuning his exit note. Thank you, Kenneth. That was beautifully put. So there you have it, all the ingredients. Experts who wrap their expertise and knowledge into a template, then put this behind an app that can then be deployed on the web and run safely quickly, easily, by anyone who needs to make such calculations. So let's look at a few more examples, because this isn't pie in the sky. It's happening as we speak now. So here's a toolbox of applications, such applications, ranging in complexity from simple spring calculations to very complicated calculations run, uh, you know, that sim app that you see up there, which is called a socket stack sim app run by engineers at Intel. This simulates you know, load, shock loads on entire motherboards with, with chips on them. That particular application, uh, the models are so complex, uh, the abacus models in this particular case, that the experts would take one to two weeks to create one of them correctly before they can run it. I, I, I did say one to two weeks. 
With an app like this, you can have the non-experts who understand motherboards and motherboard design assembling together the same model through using libraries of components in 15 minutes. Let's look at a couple more examples. A bottle crush application, for example, run by a, uh, used by a plastics container manufacturer. Libraries of fully parameterized CAD, or you can bring your own CAD to the table, as long as it follows the same functional architecture, works on the entire family of containers, it runs complex LSDynar impact calculations. The user picks the bottle, changes the CAD and non-CAD parameters, and hits calculate reviews key results and shares them with his colleagues. Accessible from anywhere on the web, model setup time going from you know, two to four hours using experts that need to know CAD, meshing, and LS Diner, to seconds, minutes with a non-expert safely running these calculations. Here's another example being used by a brake manufacturing company. Again, fully parameterized CAD, but in this case it starts to get more interesting. You can make configuration changes. You can go from that six-bolt configuration to any number you want there. What that does to the simulation, it looks in, like an innocent change, but it, it means that you now have to deal with contact conditions that are changing. That's what took, the, in this case, the ANSYS expert four to six hours to put together one of these things. It's now minutes. And it doesn't matter whether the SCAD is NX or CATIA or PROE. The template works because the engineering and simulation does not care what the CAD is. But what's the secret sauce behind these? It's the templates. And with this environment, you're graphically building these templates rapidly. The current method of building templates is scripting. That can take months. This can be done within a few days. So here's an example that, uh, once again, goes back to something that Mark said which is that we really need to get to the point where we can rapidly do optimization. So with this, with this kind of automation for doing bumper calculations, the manufacturer is now able to do fully automated optimizations, changing the design in any way, shape, or form they wish, or they wish to, creating optimized designs that can reduce the mass, and doing this automatically. As the manager said, the first time we used this automation template, the first time, we set up more models in an hour with non-experts than we were able to do in a week with our experts. This was the first time they used the templates. Yes, Brad. You want to get me off of here? Yeah. All right, let's, um, let's move further on. So let me just conclude this. So we've got two types of applications. You've got the general purpose simulation environments, and they're invaluable. They allow the experts to model complex processes, to create templates and best practices. They need these tools. The experts need these tools. They're powerful. They have tons of features. However, almost by definition, they're inherently complex and not usable by anyone other than the experts. And then you have this other class of simulation tools, the web-deployed simulation apps, or sim apps as we call them. They're task-specific, so they're narrowly defined. They get answers to specific questions and for specific product lines. But they allow non-experts, anyone in the product development organization, to be able to run these simulations anytime they need to and get the answers that they need safely and reliably because the expertise has been built into them. These are highly usable by everyone in such product development organizations, both the experts and the non-experts. And it is my contention that we can increase the number of simulation users by one to two orders of magnitude by being able to provide these sorts of tools. And I'd like to loop back to a couple of things that Mark said that I think are important. The first thing he said was, we shouldn't trust the numbers you get out of a single simulation. We shouldn't. They're almost meaningless. And secondly, we need to use simulation as a way to build corporate knowledge about our products and how they behave. And I contend that the only way that's going to happen 
is if absolutely everyone involved in the product development process, anyone and everyone, can run these simulations everywhere from the concept stage all the way to the detailed design stage at the right level of fidelity and get the answers that they need, running optimizations and design space exploration easily. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm.